Welcome to Girl in the Gov, the podcast. Where our goal is to make politics more accessible and less intimidating. The show features an interview with an expert in the political field, walking us through the many cues we have about politics, civics, government, and more. By providing civic education in the places we are. On our phones. And in the language we speak. And yes, we know, we say like a lot. It's kind of the point. Because <laughs> politics needed a rebrand. Welcome back to Girl on the Gov, the podcast. Happy Wednesday and happy. Oh, you know what? When we're recording this, it's State of the Union Day, but for everyone listening, it'll be the day after. Mm -hmm. So too. Which. So too. So too. It's so cute. It's really like, it's endearing. Like, I feel like I would have a little Pomeranian named So too. Yeah. Right? Is that not just like the name to dog mashup? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I get it. I wish that like we I really wish that we could like have the time to like be able to dissect the state of the union for this episode tomorrow, but obviously you guys know we record our intro the day before it comes out, so we're recording this on Tuesday, so we are in preparation mode for the state of the union right now. But we talked about it yesterday on our top stories along with the balloon if you're oh my <laughs> goodness the goddamn balloon the balloon then go listen we also talk about biden's new approval ratings and the polls that came out about him and how people are not feeling it as far as him running for re-election and then also the attempted attack on baltimore power grid. Electrical grid. yeah yeah so Go listen if you haven't yet. And we'll be, I guess, doing some type of breakdown for State of the Union in some content form for everybody. So stay tuned on our socials. But I'm excited to see what happens. I'm excited too. And I just, it feels very like like night before the big event type vibes or like the wedding or the birthday party or whatever. And I just, the we're not even in DC, which is a little bit of a bummer, but regardless, I feel the yeah. energy like from all these miles away. I really do. Well, and our friends on the hill are just talking about how crazy it is over there. Just yeah. locked and loaded. In yeah, fact, we're getting the live tweets. It's fine. It's fine. All of the big fences apparently are back up because, you know, State of the Unions are apparently always super high security, but post insurrection era, even more so. So I'm we're hearing from the ground of the hill that shit's crazy over there. So not crazier than my cowlick, which if you're watching on YouTube, you get to see firsthand. The amount of like little breakage hairs that are just all of like all on the line of my hairline. (sighs) I don't know what to do about it. I am getting a haircut on Wednesday, which I'm excited about. And I'm going to make sure I get to the bottom of this. But I just feel like I have more breakage than ever in these front this front area. Okay, yours I have maybe an answer for. You know how you do the slick back? Yeah. A lot of that. I wonder if that's breaking it because it's like you're pu- like it's like pulling the hair. Pulling. That would be my yeah. guess. Other, if it's not that, I've got no ideas besides. I mean, winter, I've been doing like slickbacks for so long though. I'm like, why now? Why these slickbacks? You know. Mm, but that's fair. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But one thing that I did want to talk about that we didn't talk about yesterday on Top Stories was the Grammys because Jill Biden showed up and she was just looking more cute and gorgeous than ever first of all so cute shining shining in her sparkly dress but did you did you watch the clip I sent you oh yeah so background guys I am not like a big award show person it's I'm not either like, except for the look, like, if, That's like the only if someone invited me to go I would go but it wouldn't be because I'm like yeah award show I'm so curious who wins or blah blah, blah. I pay attention to any of that right. it's literally for the fact that I would get to dress up and I would probably be asleep at the switch during the entire event yeah, um, well, we love a no hate, exciting. No exactly. So we love some performances. So I just yeah. Either way, look, everyone has their thing. It's not mine. Once the outfits are shown, I'm over. I'm over it. That's that's my my two cents on that. In terms of Jilly B's speech, I know that you want a reaction, but I'm like, hmm, what type of reaction do you want? Well, I just want your pure reaction. I don't have anything like necessarily okay. bad to say. I'm just um, so curious. Well, well, let's just see. But what do you have to say about it? Okay. I think that there is a plus and a minus to her presenting an award for a song 
focused on the Iranian revolution. I think the negative, I'll start with that, is that I feel like it would be so much more powerful if an Iranian activist, especially all the women, especially surely those that are also in the U.S. that are working towards more sanctions and actually having those sanctions mean something and, you know, fighting with the women of Iran, which have been leading this revolution to, you know, if it were coming from one of those voices, you know, really like pairing that, I think it would just be so much more meaningful and powerful. That said, so I'll put that into one bucket. I think my other reaction, though, is it's kind of an interesting diplomatic commentary from the Biden administration, like a way in which they can comment on it indirectly. Like they're saying we're signing off on this revolution, but we're not we're not sending out a press release saying so. We're not saying an official comment. We're doing it on behalf of the Grammys. It's like right. the subtweet of subtweets, which I think is strategic. I think it's smart. I think it's interesting. But it like creates this dynamic where I'm like, hmm, I think this would be more powerful in its actuality if it came from the voices that were making it happen. I think it's powerful for the Biden administration to actually be making some sort of comment, even if they're saying it's really not from them. That's the thing is I want to know who, like how the Grammys works. Is there is like a board or the, you know, Academy chooses winners for every award. And so I would assume that the Grammys were the one who said that like this song, this artist is the winner and then asked Joe Biden to present it. So I like, I, I, I mean, I don't know, knowing like how I'm sure thoughtful and meticulous, like the comms team is at the white house. They're probably like, okay, what is the award? Who's getting it? What does that mean for us? But I would assume like at the end of the day, like it was the Grammys being like, Hey, do you want to present this award? It's going to this person. I could and also see it coming from the other direction, though. Like I them, could too, or but like even no to one... there being an open invite of, "Hey, we'd love for you to present," and then providing all of the options, the and then the comms team from the White House being like, "Okay, well, we can strategically make something out of this because there's a political, very specific political tie to it, and that's their yeah. their measure." Well, my there. my thoughts are when I first watched it, I was like, "Oh, this is nice," and I feel like we haven't seen much from the white house about the iranian revolution like at all and so i was like okay like that's good they're speaking out about it but like the more that i've sat on it i'm like it's like you said it should be there should have been more to it i feel like it just was like cut off and then she that what you didn't see in the clip was she actually then presented an award after that and it was it was like some regular award like song of the year like something you know with okay. yeah, Harry like Styles or who all right. the all the like classic nominees but like then that she they had her present that award first and then it like so she basically the ending was she was like he's in prison the song was amazing and it just like wasn't paired with action and I think especially because of the inaction from the administration on this issue totally I was just like there's sh- how about like he's in prison but here are the things we can do to like help him and help uplift other, you know, people fighting in this revolution or like, I literally sleep next to the president at night. So like, this is what we're doing. You know, it's just was, it was interesting to see their first, one of their like first big steps into this topic be something like this. Like, I just feel like we need much more. And then it had me thinking too, I'm like, I wonder if this is going to come up in the state of the union at all. It's interesting for sure, but I totally agree with that. It's the action item element of it is missing. And if that's where, like with the video you sent me, if that's really where it cuts off totally, it feels, it does feel really incomplete. You know what I mean? Like it, like what would have even two would have been more powerful is then save and she was the one announcing it. Right. Mm -hmm. And she gets through that part and she's like, speaking of people that are fighting for human rights in Iran, like let me bring up a few amazing activists that are doing the work here and there, you know, whatever it is and having a few of the American, not American, like the activists that are on American soil come up to the stage and there'd be something to it. I don't know exactly what it would be, but there's, there's a next step that could have been possible there. And Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this is what she said. She said, congratulations, Shriven, and thank you for your song. And then like went on to present best song 
what to like Lizzo, Adele, Harry Styles, like everyone, yeah. you know, and it's just like. Miss, it's you know, just, close but no cigar. That's what that definition yeah. is. Or at mm. least like also what, what it really needed to be was even it, it should have been a much, they should have painted the picture of the situation much better because the real problem with you know, this revolution that's happening is that not enough people are talking about it. And right. if she's on this big platform, she could have taken much more time to talk about what's happening and hopefully prompt people to be like, we need to continue to talk about this. Don't stop right. talking about this. I don't know. There's just could have been much more, but I totally agree with that. I think, yeah, I, I a hundred percent I 100% stand on that. I think there need to be more. I'll be curious if something comes up in the speech tonight. I have a feeling no, though. I really I have a feeling no, too. And that's the thing that also bothers me is like, usually the first lady will take on issues that like, I guess just aren't on the forefront, like the big priority issues or political issues. Michelle Obama did, you know, the whole nutrition thing. Like it's always important stuff, but not like these hot button issues. And to see her take the time to speak out, I just feel like it shows that it's just not on any type of priority list for the White House, unfortunately. Yeah, I look, I have a lot of hopes for this revolution. It's a woman-led revolution, and we need eyes on it. We need eyes on the amazing activists that are putting their lives in danger to fight for freedom and their human rights, their rights to literally exist and have freedom in this world. So... Also, that's kind of the perfect segue to learning more about what's happening there, what you can do to help. With our episode with Alika Laban, she is an activist and runs us through what's happening there, how you can help, what she expects to come. It's honestly, it's an episode and interview that we did earlier this fall, but so much of it is still so, so relevant, especially the tips and tricks she shares on how you can actually be active in this space. So, yeah. The background on the situation is there, which is really important for everyone to hear and understand. And then also the action items and things that we can do to help is still timely today. So go listen. And speaking of the State of the Union, this episode is going to be the perfect thing to listen after you listened to the State of the Union because we are talking all about speech writing. That we are. We are talking about speech writing with Christopher Huntley, who is a top notch speech writer. He's one of the very few actually black speech writers in the political space. Mm -hmm. And he has carved out an amazing career, including working with Elizabeth Warren on some of her key speeches, some that are like, you'll just, you'll know, you'll know the speeches when, when we drop some of those links. And he now works as a VP at Blue State doing all of the best communications things. He is just so good at what he does and explaining what he does. And if you've ever been curious about what speech writers do and how they work and also how to get into that space, like if you're thinking, I really like writing and I also like politics, how do I combine those things? This episode is definitely for you. You're going to want to tune in. You're going to want to share it with your friends. But anyways, without further ado, here's Christopher. Well, we are so excited to chat with you today. Look, anyone Addie sends our way, we know we're going to be obsessed with. It's just kind of like <laughs> it comes with the territory. We love the Blue State crew in general. So we cannot wait to get into this conversation with you and especially touch on your career as a speech writer. And I should preface, you are the first speech writer we've had on the podcast. At least Oh, wow. Our- we're making history. Yeah. Yes. You are the first here. And we have so many questions. So many. This okay. is a, you know, political career that we haven't touched at all. And we know our listeners want to know, like, how do you get into speech writing? Mm-hmm. What sort of sets you in that trajectory? And, you know, what kind of spoke to you about speech yeah. writing? Well, I mean, thank you all for having me. I think what y'all are doing on Beyonce's internet is really important to kind of bridge (laughs) the divide and to, you know, really let folks know that it's not just a concept or a thing that is outside of the the realm of possibility for their lives. Politics impacts us all. So really appreciate you all being able to, you know, break it down for folks. I mean, I don't know. Speech writing to me is always such, it's a, it is kind of an ephemeral concept to think about. I think for so long, in you know modern political life right 
the, the concept of a speechwriter was seen as a deceptive, shadowy wizard behind the behind the curtain. And I think now, as we have become more modern, become more connected, and people have become more intertwined, it's just understandable that a politician, a leader, or, or a CEO, or any kind of principal, they don't have the time, if they're leading and doing the thing right, right. they don't have the time to always sit down and, you know, put all of their time and their thoughts and their intentions into into a speech. And so the role of a speechwriter is really to kind of be the animating heart, the, the the beating heart of the speaker or the cause. And so for me, that that goes back to kind of understanding who people are. It goes back to understanding what audiences are looking for. And for me, that goes back to church. I am a, a church boy, born and raised in Albany, New York, from seven generations of Pentecostal preachers and whatnot. And at one point, folks thought that that was the path that I was going to take. But, you know, did a little bit of twist in the turn, <laughs> came out when I was 16, and I guess it just shifted everything. Yeah. But, you know, I, I found that what I learned from my my mother and my father, my great-grandfather, my great, all of them, was that, you know, to and if you're going to move people's hearts and their minds, you have to be able to direct, relate directly to them. And I always caught on to that from a very young age. So got in the theater, thought I was going to be an actor. That didn't work out. Went to college, thought I was going to be a, a broadcast journalist. That wasn't really the stage. And then I found politics around Obama, like so many of us in the generation. And I had a choice to make between whether I was going to do political science and try to be the legislative, you know, kind of congressperson track, or I was going to study public relations and use it politically. And I found that it was just great. I could get, I got to tell stories. I got to write. I got to kind of shape messages. And it wasn't until... I had my first job working for in the United States Senate for Senator Harry Reid and Maya Angelou passed away. And, you know, there was some urgency in the office to kind of get a statement out and get a speech out, but it wasn't fast enough for me. And I had been around for a little while and I just passionately wrote it out and sent it. And the team was just like, wait a minute. Yeah. This is, so, we don't need to edit this much. <laughs> this guy's got and it. So, yes. Yeah, it's a thing. It's like something you don't have to, mm-hmm. because yeah. a lot of times, there's a lot of content that's always going and you need people to create it. And yeah, it's like a whole they sent it out. It. Yeah, it is. It is. People think that it's usually just one person, but people, you know, don't get to these places or meet these moments by themselves. Just huge yeah. staff, huge team that does everything. And from that moment forward, they kind of just kind of had me, you know, on a speech writing track. And then the, the, I remember the day, the week that marriage equality decision and the affordable care act decision came down to Supreme court the speechwriter that I was working underneath as his deputy got like really, really sick. And there was no one else that knew what the process, which I call chaos management. So they just <laughs> threw me in there. Call and opportunity. from there, I mean, grace, opportunity, window, whatever it mm-hmm. was, I jumped in and did that. And from there, I went to work for the convention and Hillary Clinton and Congresswoman Barbara Lee, and then Senator Warren, where I was her speechwriter in the Senate office. And then on the presidential campaign. And now I have the privilege at Blue State as vice president of strategic communications. I write for, you know, a plethora of democratic high profile leaders. And it's a joy of a lifetime to be able to help people kind of move hearts and minds. So it was a, anyone you talk to about this profession, it's just like a roundabout way. And then when you add the fact that I'm a black speech writer, now I'm really a unicorn because people don't really, it's like seven of us. Not really. Really? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's such an amazing journey, first of all. And I also like love what you said too about like helping these leaders meet these really important moments and how like it takes a team. And I think sometimes it's like, I'm sure people would look and be like, oh, he didn't even write that speech, like looking at like a leader or something. But it's, but it's so important to have people like you be able to communicate these messages that are so important. Because like you said, like Mm -hmm. these people also have to like, lead and do all these other amazing big things so to help kind of facilitate meeting those moments i think is huge and hopefully people can you know understand that and respect it because it's such an important like art and piece of this political world it really is it really is i mean i I look at it as as standing in the gap you know yeah that's what i would look at Mm -hmm. yeah and i you also said that you get to meet all these personalities and you have to actually communicate who they are and what their messaging is and do it in a way that just, it feels authentic to them. And I'm curious what that process is like. Like, (laughs) is it an intake form? Is it a getting to know, you know, Joe Schmo down the street? Like, how does that actually work? And what is the the process in taking personality to paper? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's a really interesting question. And I think that when it's done correctly, 
the intake process for any speech, any set of public remarks that you are preparing for a person that is not yourself is best done with the, the heart or the DNA of the speaker included on the very front end. So I am adamant that even if it's five to 10 minutes, right, I want to speak to the speaker. I don't care if you are, you know, a senator, a, mm -hmm. you know, an alderman, a council person. I want to speak to you because at the end of the day, you are the speaker. These words are coming out of your mouth. Absolutely. And, you know, there is a tendency, I think, sometimes in our profession it, for folks to like, well, I'm the writer. I am the, I, I have the poetic prose. I have the frame and the structure. And that's fine. You are right. Like you, this, that is the truth. But at the end of the day, if it's not delivered well, if it's not believed, yeah. you know, by the, you know, the, the, by the delivery is not going to connect. So to me, I start by reaching out and asking, Hey, you know, now this every experience varies. So I try to reach out with some people on the on the low end of the spectrum of kind of what's most helpful is folks who just have no idea really what they want to say. And they're just, you know, yeah. they're reaching out to you so that you can think through that. And in those instances, I go in with maybe two or three ideas about what might meet the moment, a topic, a theme, something that, you know, comes from their bio or their work that might be helpful. On the high end, of kind of like really helpful brain firing off collaborative you know what i would yeah. call the the warren world of the things because we that's just what we do it's the speaker will have you know a very clear idea about what they want to say and the flow and what they want to feel and how you know what they want to say what they want people to remember any anecdotes and those are the moments where it's really helpful to talk on the front end because you get that and you can take that and like okay now i have it sometimes i record it sometimes i just write it down for mm -hmm. me i'm very audio i'm very visual so i need to either hear the speaker or talk to them or see something that they have done in the past that just allows me to get their essence and then from there, I go into an outline mode of, okay, here are yeah. the specific pieces that we want to connect to. And I mean, there's a I, there's a formula to it. Like there, there are certain formulas to it, certain things that work, but in general, it's different every, every which way. But that's how it yeah. usually starts off is by getting that intake, that real input from the principal. And the principal is not available sometimes. And who's the senior staff or who holds the story? Because right. I'm telling the story, right? Like, let's yeah, find yeah. out who holds the story. Mm -hmm. And, and I can be able to like tell in their voice. That's what oh, I was going to say, yeah. like the intonation yeah. of even like the delivery of something like this is obviously not at the same stakes, but like we'll get an ad read, for example, and, you know, we're supposed to read it exactly as is. And it is not following our speech pattern typically at all. And it takes us like 15 times to read this mini speech, this ad read. And it's one, because honestly, we can't read half the time. That's, that's a huge part of it. I'm going to just flag that there's that element, but also sometimes it's just really not the order in which we typically choose our words or where we throw our intonations and how we, you know, exclaim certain phrases and whatnot. And I think that's got to be such a huge part of it in having those oh. conversations of knowing, okay, when do they typically take a breath between facts, between action items, between whatever they're trying to get across? Because if you give someone tongue twisters that they're not used to doing, I mean, I feel like that really kind of hinders everything now. No, it definitely does. And you have to know who you are, who you are writing for and how they speak and what the cadence is. And even down to, you know, how many words they speak per minute, what feels long to them, what feels short. I mean, the average speaker speaks 125 words per minute. So when you're thinking about that, OK, if I've given you 250 words, how fast are you going to speak that? How slow are you going to speak it? Are you someone who likes to have really complex sentences or you want to be clear, concise? And, you know, do you want to have more of a staccato feel to where you're going. Are you a pregnant pause person or are you someone who wants to move into cascades? Are you a litany person who speaks in threes and then makes your point? Or are you someone who really wants to take an antidote, wind it down, and at the end of it, have a really, you know, a crescendo of applause? Mm -hmm. It all, there. these are all like actual techniques that people, yeah. that people don't realize go into the heart of, of crafting a speech. And a lot of that, all those elements that we just talked about, yes, those are rhetorical devices, but a lot of that comes into the, the the delivery and the prep that after it's written, now that you have it on the page, now we have to get it into your heart. And then once we get it into your heart, we have to get it out of, you know, your your voice. And that's the challenge, but that's the fun part to me. I mean, yeah. the, the writing is the, you know, the challenging part, but, you know, staging it and making sure that, you know, it gets delivered correctly is something that I really enjoy. Yeah. yeah. And like, once you're in that process, is there ever a time where you end up changing parts of the speech because it's just not matching up with like the way they're delivering it. And if so, how does that work? 
Yes. I mean, I will. So, okay, for instance, right? So we are, I'll go back to Iowa, New Hampshire primary 2020 with Senator Warren, right? We obviously, Iowa was Iowa and whatever. You know, we were waiting for the results to come in. And as we're waiting for the results to come in, particularly in Iowa, right, there were there were electronic issues that were happening and people yeah. weren't understanding what was happening with the reporting. And so as these things are happening, we have a, a final mock of the speech. Actually, you know, you have three versions. On election night, I like to have three versions of a speech that are drafted, that have had, uh, that have been molded by the team and that like exist. There's a, you know, yeah. a victory. There's a, ooh, this is uncertain. And there's a, wow things didn't turn out the right way, right? So I'm living right. with those three worlds in my head at all times. But regardless of what the outcome was going to be, we knew that things were going, you know, going south. So as with the reporting, so as we are trying to figure out when she goes out, what she says, et cetera, some of the pieces had to be changed. But that's important. That's why it's important to make, unless you're doing, depending on what kind of speech you're giving, you want to make sure that it can be a bit modular because we, especially when you're writing for politicians, we live in a day and an age where anything can happen and you might need to do breaking news at the top of your remarks and then go into, you know, whatever, like any tragedy can happen and anything really great could happen. We live in a 24 seven news cycle. And so you have to make it modular, but yeah, there are changes. Sometimes there are changes right up until the last minute. I mean, I remember being in Washington square, square park, there's 25,000 people outside. We're about to give one of the marquee speeches for the campaign and there was a policy difference that we needed to tweak and some lines we needed to cut. So I'm back there tweaking and making sure at this point, the speech is in the teleprompter. So I'm mm -hmm. working with the teleprompter operator and I'm making sure that all the changes oh, yeah. we made in the car are like there so that by the time, you know, yeah. you hit the stage, everything that you change in the car on the way there is reflected in the teleprompter. It doesn't necessarily need to be on my laptop. Stressful. It's already been sent to the prompter. Yeah, it is a little bit, but it's fun. <laughs> It is no, fun. It's, fun. it's fun. It's raining. People yeah. are like, oh, Sarah, the it's like game time out there. Yeah, it definitely yeah. is. Definitely I also is. just read Electable by Ali Vitelli, and it talks about that specific moment that, yeah. like, literally Washington Square Park situation. And now I officially <sighs> feel like I was at that event. So thank you we for rounding out the whole story. I, it's yeah. amazing. I so Ali is a great friend. Ali is a good friend, and she's a powerful journalist. I, I, I respect her so much. That book is amazing. And the thing I will just quickly say about that speech was we very early on, we had to figure out how we were going to distinguish the senator on in the field. And obviously, well, not obviously, but to us, her policies and her plans were going to be one of the, the central pieces. When it came to the marquee tentpole speech moments, like what are the big speeches you're going to give and how are you going to tell the story of the campaign, the theory of the case? From the very beginning, when we did the launch speech, we chose, lo we were looking for locations that connected to her bio or connected to her general fights. It's my jam to just pick a look because I think locations can ground people into a moment and yeah, into a cause definitely. in a way that sometimes, you know, folks don't really realize. And so we chose Lawrence, Massachusetts, because that is where the bread and rose strike happened in the 19, early 1900s, where the workers got together and they were, you know, on unreasonable conditions and unlikely people came together across lines of difference to make change, which is like the whole ethos of the campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we went to Lawrence, we went to the factory, we had the speech there. And we showed that the fights that they were in then are some of the fights that we're in now and those lessons can lead us. And then we did that at Lawrence. It worked really great. I was like, OK, we can find it again. We found another one at Washington Square Park, where the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was right behind it. All those young immigrant women, people coming together. Francis Perkins had been watching the, the, the devastation, and it led to all these different changes. Boom. Did it. Set it. Used the same formula. Used it to lay out theory of the case. Looking for another one. 1886, in Atlanta, there were a set of washerwomen, Black washerwomen, who had been underestimated, devalued, underpaid. They came together in 1886 and put an ad out in the paper and said, we're not having it anymore. We're not going to wash until you all meet our demands because we are people too. So use that to talk about racial justice and mm -hmm. you know how you can bring it together and how every fight 
is all of our fights and that it, there's no one and done for every inch that you take there's another mile to run for progress we did it for justice for janitors in california so i was just loving that whole series of speeches it was so great Definitely. we had like six more we were gonna do but i'm glad all you of, got that it was so all of that context is so important to like painting the bigger picture mm-hmm. so i love all of those examples and our gov club is gonna love this conversation because they're oh reading God, yes. that book right now in their book club that's our like brand ambassadors so that's amazing quick plug go sign up for the gov club but we have to ask before we get more into this like speech writing mm-hmm. process what is your favorite election night speech you've ever heard and what's your favorite speech you've ever written oh <laughs> favorite election night speech i've you ever, ever heard, heard. I, I and i mean at the this is gonna seem really kind of cliche I, so we, <laughs> we, I am i am at at Blue State, like one of Blue State offices in D.C., Blue State was born out of the Obama campaign, was one of, was very instrument, instrumental in the Obama campaign. And so there's a lot of, no matter where, it's certain rooms have different figures. So this is the Obama room that I'm in. There's a warrant. Yeah. There's a, you know. Go uh, watch on yeah. YouTube to but, see yourself. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I'm not just saying this because this is here, but I, in New Hampshire in 2008, after he had lost the New Hampshire primary, then candidate, uh, then Senator Obama, gave a speech about the heart of the campaign. And it's what they end up calling the Yes We Can speech. But he talks about the heart of America and what has what it takes for us to come together. And in, in spite of the odds that we have faced, we there's been this creed, there's been this ethos that has rung out across generations. Yes, we can. And oh my God, it just goes into it. And I mean, there was a his the actual slogan of the campaign was, I think, change we can believe in. But yes, we can after that moment. And I, and you probably remember the, yes, we can. Yes, we can. But it was it was more about saying that in a moment where they had just lost mm-hmm. and they were being underestimated, but tying that back to all of the different points in history where the foot soldiers in the civil rights movement, where the labor movement, where the, you know, folks really were not, when, the, when folks are underestimated, when we come together across race and across place and across difference, there's... The only response to that is that there is no obstacle that we can't face. So, yes, we mm-hmm. can. So that's, to me, election night, because it was election night and he lost. Mm-hmm. And so that was one of the speeches he had to give. But that was that changed the trajectory of that of that entire campaign. So Epic. that, I think, is my favorite election night speech. The favorite speech that I've written so far that I can say <laughs> that I've written, that I'm not wrapped up under an NDA. Sometimes that's how Fair. it goes. That's how it goes. Okay, I'm, I'm torn between two. You can have more than Again, one. You can do two. Yeah, yeah. We'll I'll do two. two really quickly. Really two. Yeah. So the first one, and I won't say favorite, but it's it's most impactful to me in my career as a writer. It was the at the very, very beginning. When in, in 2015, don't, I'll get the, the date right, but in 2015, after the Mother Emanuel shooting where all those nine parishioners were shot down and killed, Senator Reed, rest in peace, Senator Reed, love that man. Senator Reed gave a speech, was supposed to give a speech on the Senate floor. And again, this is that point where I had just become the writer and I'm trying to figure it all out. And we had to meet the moment. And I remember sitting in front of my screen, figuring out how can I meet this moment? What am I going to say? I mean, there are things you can say about gun violence and racism in America, but here I am, you know, a black man in the Capitol writing for Senator Reid. My ancestors built this building. White Mm -hmm. supremacy is still trying to take us down. I got to meet this moment, you know? And I remember just thinking back to before I even moved to DC, one of the first portions of my political awakening was when the children in Newtown got mowed down and just so viciously murdered. I remember that. And I was like, how many times are we going to do this? So that's Mm -hmm. when that was the frame that I went back to. I went through every single major mass shooting and I walked through the date. I walked through the casualties, walked through the date. It was a a rhetorical device, went through Mm -hmm. that. And I had him use that. And it was really powerful. So that stands out to me. And then, and then with Senator Warren on New Year's Eve of 2020, I guess. Yeah. We did this speech called the Tomorrow Speech. The campaign was wrapping up. Impeachment was on the way. But we talked about the power of imagination in the world that you want to live in. And we we went to went to a, a, a legislative house in Massachusetts where Phyllis Wheatley was once a beautiful poet laureate and just beautiful, beautiful mind in African-American history. 
she was she was once denied presence there. And we use that as an, a jumping off point of talking about how we can the tomorrow that we want to live in and what that would look like if all of the plans and policies she's been talking about have been implemented. What would that feel like? What would it what when, you know, I'm it, we're fighting for a world where, you know, climate change has been addressed, et cetera. And so that was it, it was a really good one. And it was New Year's Eve. And I, do I you really have like it. links for yeah. these that we can put in our little episode description? I do. Yeah, yeah. I have okay. them. Yeah, I have them. Yeah. I have them. And then there's a and it, it's no profit or anything to me because I just don't. But there's a, all of those five speeches that I was talking about, of which the Phil, the tomorrow speech is one of them. They're in a book called Only Righteous Fight Center Warrant. We just put it together and put it oh, out on nice. the store. So okay. uh, yeah, people can see. Mm-hmm. Love Iconic. I do have a technical, like more like career <laughs> advice question with this. Mm-hmm. Would you recommend for someone that's interested in getting into speech writing to either major in history or double major in like politics and history? Like what t- sort of formula there do you yeah. think works best? Because you, you know, obviously so much of so many of these speeches have great historical references and also clearly the skill set to be able to find references. Maybe you you know, had to dig into a specific area's history about or whatnot. And I'm just curious, like, especially for our golf clubbers that are interested in getting to political careers, what, what's the recommendation? Yeah. I mean, I think that's right. If I could go back and do, do a thing that would help propel me further in my career and would be super helpful, I would take more history courses because the thing about it is that, you know, history doesn't always necessarily repeat itself, but it definitely rhymes. Sadly, so many of the fights that we are in now, so many of the issues that we're facing, we've been here before. Yeah. And there are lessons, the little breadcrumb trails that we can yeah. follow to, yeah. you know, toward progress. And so stepping back and looking at those moments. So I was thinking about this the other day, actually, how we are at this intersectional moment where everything is moving to the metaverse and everything is going virtual. And like, what does that look like? What's that extension? What does that, what does that shift from, you know, to this automated world look like? Well, I don't know when we went from, you know, horse and buggy to automobile, what was happening when the, that tech, technology moved around? Like what, what was culturally, yeah. what were people talking about, right? right. At those different points in, in life. Mm-hmm. Could be something there. And so, I, yeah, I would definitely do that. I would also recommend that people, what I call my speechwriter's Bible is the speechwriter's companion book by Robert Lerman. And I'll give you guys links for that. But this yeah. is a beautifully, oh my God, it walks you through every single kind of speech that you would ever need to give. And it helps you break them down into a technical ways. Talks about Monroe's motivated sequence that you can use to write any kind of speech in any kind of setting. Every speech from the I ha- from I have the dream, I have a dream speech from Dr. King to to just even some political ads are all around that sequence. So I would recommend that. Mm-hmm. We'll be well, purchasing. yeah. Um, let's get into this these technical questions for right, you. Like, do how do we write speeches? Okay, what is the typical process here for a speechwriter like you? Okay. And also curious, like, how much input an elected or candidate has in that process? And like, does that vary? Like, can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing that you have to do is figure out, okay, once you know that you are going to be writing for someone, and they're going to be speaking, you need to figure out where they're going to be speaking and who they're going to be speaking to. So who's the audience, right? What is what is the backdrop by which you will be or your principal will be delivering remarks? And so that you do, you have to do research. What time? When is it? Where is it? What are the, the events in it? Is there a theme? Is there a theme? Themes are so helpful. and People forget about themes so much mm-hmm. because themes are themes are the way that something is advertised. So people come in thinking that they're right. going to be under the auspices of a theme. And you come here talking about climate change and we were just going to be talking about, you know, a, a total different topic. That's not it. It could be, you can weave it in, but you need to weave right. it in. So what's yeah. the theme? And then once you do that, then you want to come up with a, a, a set of concepts. What are the ideas? What are, what are, what's going to move an audience? And when I say what's going to move an audience, what does that audience care about? Those folks walked into that climate change conference because they care about climate change. So what is the hot button issue that day? And where does your principal sit with that issue, with that urgency, with that conversation? And then from there, I think what you need to do is what have they always, always look to see what they have said previously on the topic? You do not have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, sometimes you do, but by the, the vast majority of speakers have been speaking. 
for a while, or if they haven't been speaking for a while, somebody's been talking about it. So, you know, do some research and figure out what the conversation is. And then from there, this is when you do what I call the speech conference, where you go to the principal. And this is that spectrum I was talking about earlier. And you always go with one or two ideas about what they could talk about, but you want to see if they have anything on their mind. If they have something on their mind, okay, let's talk through it. Yeah, that could work. Take some notes. Be really intentional. Listen to what they are saying. Write it down. If you have their permission, record it. There's no substitute to having that kind of having that conference being played back when you start to try to write. So if they have an idea, work through it. And that's even better. You can go and flesh that idea out. If they don't present two or three ideas, two options of what might work. Once you do that, you had your speech conference. And then the next step is to do what I call, I, it's kind of like cringy, but I say throwing up on the page. Like I just start by just writing down all the things, writing down all of my feelings, all of what was said, all of what needs, and you know, in order sometimes not, but I do it. I put it all out there. And then from there, I back it up into an outline. And I'm going to give you kind of the, the outline usually shakes out into kind of five sections. And this is the Monroe's motivated sequence for speech writing. And there's five elements to it. There's attention, there's need, there's satisfaction, visualization, and then there's the call to action. So attention is that right at the top, you want to get their attention, make a statement. You know, climate change is the greatest threat to human existence or, you know, police brutality is a scourge on America. You know, what is the attention grabber? You want to do that really quick. And then after you do that, you want to speak to the need. And that's essentially state what the problem is, right? The problem is that we have bias and hatred and discrimination and bigotry within our system, right? What is the, the actual problem? And then right after the problem, go right to the solution. I propose, right? Or I am standing for, or I'm in this conference or I'm in this conversation because I believe that we can create a world where XYZ doesn't exist by passing this policy, by standing up for this, by standing up for that. And then the next piece is visualization. What will it look like and feel like, right? Mm -hmm. Where you are not penalized for, for low level you know, drug infractions or a world where you are, you're able to actually become a citizen in America because it's a pathway to citizenship. Like give people a, 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 a sense of what it will look and feel like. And then on the way out, ask them to do something. Now, whether that is to support a bill or to sign a pledge or to call a member or to knock on a door, always leave people with something to do. So attention, mm -hmm. need, satisfaction, visualization, and then a call to action. It's the Monroe's motivated sequence. I love when things Every are laid speech. out like that. And just like Every having a structure and one that you know works. And especially if you're mm -hmm. like putting everything on the page first and then that you can just like kind of plug and play almost. I love that. Yeah. like yeah. And like, don't be afraid of an outline. Yeah. Yeah, oh. definitely. And, I, and, I, and don't be afraid of an outline. I mean, I take those five pieces and make an outline. Don't spend your time like, you know you know, get that on the page, but then like turn it into an outline and see where the flows are, Absolutely. see where the transitions are. And then from there, share that with the principal or share that with someone senior and, and then start writing. Some people just start writing. And just, where, yeah. Where are you going? Oh my gosh. Yeah. See, that would drive me crazy. I would just start writing and not know where I was going, but to be able to <laughs> have something to reference like that of like how to structure things mm -hmm. and make it clear and concise is amazing. Love that. Totally. Well, I'm curious what happens after a speech is given and how a speech writer maybe works with the comms team to put pieces of that speech out or any related, you know, content, whether yeah. it's a press release or whatever, like, is there, oh my God, why was I about to say collusion, collaboration, collaboration, I mean, collusion, whatever. <laughs> different C, different C. <laughs> that from vibe for sure. Yeah. But is there, you know, any collaboration between teams and how does, how do those relationships work? Well, I mean, yes, that is all happening consistently, especially the higher profile the speech, the more collaboration there is. And I, so speech writing exists between this echo chamber of policy and communications. And I have yeah. the added benefit of before I found speech writing as an art and a craft, I wore, I've, I'm a comms guy by, by yeah, heart. Yeah. So I've been communications director, press secretary, deputy, like advanced press, all the things. So I come to this work or this process always thinking from a communications lens and from a comms perspective, when you're thinking about a speech, you're thinking about, to your point, how does it live on, right? And how is it going to be framed and how is it going to be received in the press? 
So to your very astute point, the one of the ways to shape and frame a speech before it's even given and to help it live on the way you want it to is to release excerpts. I think you the place where we see this most readily done is the State of the Union, where mm -hmm. the president will send out and the comms team will grab the most quotable moments from the speech that are aligned with the strategic goals of the agenda for this for the speech. And they'll get that out to the press and that'll get people you know, writing and chasing and comparing, and they set the narrative. So the speech is delivered, excerpts have gone out, they've been filled in through the rest of the text of the speech. But then afterwards, what, I, what I've always loved to do was to particularly, and you can look this up, this is where I was, you know, I loved our team. We had such a, you know, a great team and I had Friedman do a lot of great things and to jump in and out of different hats and it was great. But you'll look at the intercept, that whole concept I talked about, the three speeches, the marquee speeches and the ordinary women coming together to do extraordinary things to build economic and political power. Ooh, mm -hmm. Somebody's on message. I I put that background together and we gave it to, you know, we pitched it as a story to a couple of reporters. Be like, hey, we're not just going to these places and talking about these things. It's on purpose. And they, and they and I can give you the article, but they, you know. They ended up writing it that way and like, you know, marquee speeches. She connects the labor movement and connects. Yes, thank you. But that <laughs> allows the speech to just not be, you know, to just live, exist beyond that. And then also yeah. in this digital age that we're in, digital age, I sound like an older person, but <laughs> it's really important to clip great moments, yep. get them oh. online, get them on social, get them on Instagram, get them on TikTok, like take 30 seconds, 15 seconds, even if it's just gestures. This is why speech prep and delivery practices is important now because people do not want to sit and listen to you drone on for 25 minutes, but they will, mm -hmm. they will watch the one minute 30 recap. And so do that proactively, get it out there and you can control your message and then is you can help like, it live on. Would you say that's like kind of, is there any type of new strategy I think, or when you are speech writing these days, just it, with that like short form video in mind, like, is there a new kind of mindset that you're in when you're writing speeches that like okay we need to at least have like one or two little clips that we can mm. you know do you know what I mean like yeah I mean I no I, I don't think I wouldn't say it's new yeah because I mean there's a couple things no matter whether you're speaking in city council congress or from, from the oval office like speakers need to be persuasive they yeah. need to be memorable they need to be understandable and they need to be quotable and so yeah. the whole time as a speechwriter, I'm thinking about all of that. Are, is, am I moving my audience? Do people understand? Am I speaking to folks, not above them, below them? Right. And then what are the moments that are going to stand out? And for me, a lot of those moments in the structure of a speech come when we're thinking about applause lines. Because nobody wants to sit, especially at a political speech. Right. Like, what is the flow? What are yeah. we leading? What are the points? So those quotable lines and those clippable moments, I like to have them coincide you know, with with the applause lines. And when I'm working with teams that I haven't necessarily worked with for a long time before, even when it gets done to it, I will like highlight and like send to the con teams like, yeah, here you go. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, like, there you go. I don't no, want you to... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's just like a, a big, a big thing now is making sure these things get on TikTok, go viral. But I also had a question too about like once mm -hmm. the speech is written, there is prep right? As far as practicing yes. all of that, can you kind of walk us through what that looks like? And, you know, I think probably there's speeches where like, say something breaks in the news and you have to like turn around a quick speech and get it out quickly. But there's also some that are kind of more, have more preparation. You know, also I have a question about debates and if you work on that, you did mm -hmm. deb debate prep. Yeah. So just curious how that looks like also as a speechwriter, like when they're say, rehearsing it are you like put a little more accent on like that word or like Definitely. pronunciate this one this way like are you kind of like a music producer where you're like hit this note a little bit different <laughs> yeah no I mean that's it's right it, it it is it's authentic and it is it's very real at the same time you are delivering a message and telling a story to people and mm -hmm. people well, you have to be persuasive it's you like have to be memorable it is a performance in a lot of ways it's still de it's a delivery so Mm -hmm. I mean, the answer is yes. Even if you're only able to speak, like run through the speech one time alone, see the mirror, that is speech prep to me. Okay. If like at, at the very least, yeah. if I can't get in the room with you, if you can't get a you know some folks that you respect to deliver it to, 
just deliver it because there is a muscle memory. There's nothing like a cold read on stage for the first time. It just, mm-hmm. it doesn't, you don't, you know, you don't feel it the right way. But at the, in the best case scenario, I run a speech prep process that's about three days before the delivery of the speech where each, I, I do three separate ones. The first one is a cold read where I let you walk through it. I'm timing you. So you know how long you're running. You know how long you're speaking. We're following along. We're seeing which we're, we're tweaking. I'm following along in a Google Doc. I'm getting rid of all the secrets. I'm following along in a Google <laughs> Doc and get my, work myself out of a job. Following along, <laughs> along in a Google Doc and in a printed version to see what there's, what words they're stumbling on. And I'm recording in that first one, recording what you actually say versus if you say this over that or y'all over you all or all those different things, because that is showing what you are comfortable with. And I want right. that on the teleprompter or on the paper in front of you. So going mm-hmm. through that and then doing what I call global feedback at the end of it and asking, how did you feel about it? If there are senior advisors in the room, two people, 20 people, you know, what's everyone's global feedback on how the speech was delivered? Okay, that's cool. Let's go back to this page. Principal said, I don't really feel like that works. I don't really feel like, okay, let's tweak it. Let's tweak it. Go back right. through page by page by page. Then take those edits. Give everybody a chance to go walk, do whatever they do. Pause, check your phone while I am fixing all the things said that we do. And then let's do it from the top. Mm-hmm. Then we do it again. You know, do that a yeah. couple of times in one session. And then now that the speech has been tweaked, then you want to send it back around to, to senior advisors or people who care about changes in the speech. Come back for the next prep session. Do it again. Same process, same process. And then the last one, this is final. No one is touching it but me and you and the powers that be unless some wild thing happens. And there is where I'm saying that's where I will do the pauses and mm-hmm. the, you know, like that's where we're like, hey, no, let's just wait right there. Okay, do you need me to remind you? Okay, I'll give you two brackets right here. Here's an asterisk, the pause. Or do you're gonna forget that this is a pause line? I will put pause, a pause there. And then from there, it goes into the teleprompter or onto the, the page and then it's ready for delivery. Mm-hmm. Wow, there it is, folks. Love it. <laughs> wait, I have one more question before we move mm-hmm. on to a different topic. You mentioned NDAs, just a little curious on <laughs> how that works. And why I mean, <clears throat> being under NDAs? It, it, I think with, with any contract where you are working so intimately and so closely with, but I, it could be a principal, it could be an actor, it could be a producer, whatever. When you, as a creative, when you are hired to help create in the name and the voice of someone else, there has to be some level of integrity and some level of accountability that you're not just going to take and run and give my creative process and walk through all these different, because it's very intimate. And so mm-hmm. I think the smart teams, not a, like a, like a, a a super binding NDA where you can never talk about it. See, I'm on here talking, but it's 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 smart to let folks know that what we are we are entering a binding contract where I'm trusting you and you're trusting me, and that's the only way the relationship really works with any principal. Mm-hmm. When you're writing for someone, or you're producing for someone, or even in any kind of creative artistic, like you know, you're doing someone's makeup, you're doing you need yeah. to be, have some integrity. I'm still thinking about Beyonce. She has everyone <laughs> signed. No How can one we knew not this think about company. Beyonce. Right, exactly. But so yeah, it's more just talking. like to set, you know kind of boundaries in the relationship so that there can be a mutual trust there and just like everything is protected yeah, versus like trust. we're not trying yeah. to like just say that you didn't write the speech or is it no is yeah, it yeah more just that, like that, setting yeah. that trust yeah yeah that, that i think that kind of approach to speech writing is long gone now there are some instances or like you know there are you know ceos or leaders are very sensitive topics that i have written for that i will never speak about and that i can never speak about because right. they you know you know, quarterly crisis, comp, but that's just like with anything in communications, right? Yeah. So if you hire me in a crisis, I'm not going to then go talk to someone about your crisis. Maybe in 10 years, I'll do a case study. <laughs> <laughs> now we really have all the secrets. No, yeah. but that is so interesting because I used to write, I used to be in PR and I used to write bylines all the time. And it was just such an interesting thing because it was like working behind the scenes and then seeing people outside of that space, reading these bylines and really thinking, oh my gosh, this CEO wrote that they're such an expert on this. And meanwhile, I'm like, if only you knew, I can't tell you, but it's me. Mm. It's not them. It's such an interesting dynamic of, you know, pulling those things together and understanding like what, you know, can be shared and what can't be shared. We're like big NDA people over here. So like, I love your NDA vibe. (laughs) It's just, you know, it's one of those things when you've seen like the worst crises happen, you just, you prepare for them. And indeed, indeed. you know, honestly, that's kind of like the perfect segue to this next topic, which is kind of like a crisis in primaries 
dealing with Diane Feinstein's seat because a little birdie told told us that you definitely you know have dipped your your toe in the waters that be over here in terms mm-hmm. of some of these players and I'm just curious like what do you think is going to happen like this is well, chaos I, I, look I don't see it as chaos I see it as oh, democracy okay. and so so I what an answer I, I, I mean <laughs> I, it's true it's, it's true. true I I worked for Congress I'm in Barbara Lee for a year and a half, maybe like a year and eight months as a communications director. And on the Hill, we were, I was so honored and proud to work with her right after Trump was elected to, was elected to, you know, help build and shape the resistance. And who better to do that than Barbara Lee, you you know, one of the most progressive members to ever be in Congress. So that was a, a privilege and honor. And I definitely am, you know, super proud of her. When it comes to the primary, I think, look, I think people are, going to rightly, the voters of California are going to have to make their decision about who best should represent them. And and I think that, you know, when you reach these crucial turning points, it can feel like, oh, the tension is chaotic, but it's actually just a turning point. We're just making a shift. And so yeah. I think the, the voters are going to decide. I'm, I'm excited to see how it shakes out. Me too. I'm a California voter. And I'm like, I feel like we yeah. haven't really even had our Senate race in a moment because of Kamala and Alex Padilla and that now All right, you know, yeah. Diane Feinstein might be stepping down. I guess we'll see. But what well, are she, I mean, she just, too? She she listen, I think that Senator Feinstein has had a long and storied career. She has, you know, done the best that she could in that in that role and she has been there for the people of California. And she deserves to make the, her decision known when she wants to make it known. At the same time, I think other folks who have ideas about what might be great for the party and what might be best for California have the right to make their decision about whether or not they're going to run. And I think that people should, as long as what I want to make sure happens here or that I'm looking at, because again, I'm from East Coast and I'm in California. I We've got to do this about values. We've got to do this about vision. And no matter what happens in the race and the primary, we've got to be moving towards progress because we cannot afford to let what's happening on the other side give any ground. I mean, we're living in a world where right-wing extremists literally tried to overthrow the Capitol and overturn elections where hate and discrimination are not only just on the rise, but they are now literally within the Congress. Like that is Mm -hmm. the actual establishment of the GOP. So while we are going to be and probably have thoughts and opinions and, you know, the people, the, the, what's the saying, the primary is for you to fall in love. And then, you know, you get in line to do what's best in the general election so that we can move forward. And I think that that's what's going to happen. And hopefully that's what we'll see. Yeah. No, totally. I'm excited to have like a big race in California. I feel like it's been a minute. Mm-hmm. And I love what you said. It's it's so true. It's going to be just democracy in action. So an That's exciting it. time. Yeah. But speaking of democracy in action and like primaries and all of that, we want to talk about mm-hmm. a little like really quick democratic conventions. We think you might oh, know yeah. a thing or two. So we we're curious just if we can thing. do our I have a stupid <laughs> question segment with you all about right, what is what is the democratic convention? Please tell. So yeah, sure. The Democratic Convention or the nominating convention, because Republicans have one as well, right? The mm-hmm. Democratic Convention is the nominate the official nominating proceedings of the political party. It is where delegates from each state, from each re- region who have been elected and chosen to come and put their to cast their vote to nominate there to nominate a candidate, they come together to do the business of the party. And it's not just to nominate, but it's also to do something to 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 sign off on something that I think people don't really understand, which is called the platform, the party platform. It's like it's essentially like the constitution of that of that moment. So what we believe, what we stand for. We stand for, you know, justice and equality and, po- and, and climate change. I think we'll see in this platform in 2024 for the convention, there will be a lot around insurrection and what has happened and the integrity of voting and all these different things. And there's going to be stuff in there around probably, you know, health and security and the preparedness for pandemics, all these different things that have come up now that we are, you know, in this world that we're in. And the convention is a week long. It's a week long, beautiful expression of the heart and soul of the party, sometimes a nightmare in case of the Republicans. But it's (laughs) where, you know, Democrats from all across the country from every spectrum of democratic politics come together. And it's where we do our big, huge showing. I had the privilege of working there under Reverend Leah Daughtry, who's the CEO. She's the only person to be CEO twice, a uh, woman, woman of color, black woman, all those things, but she did it twice it. and bossed it up. And so I just think conventions are, it's a beautiful time. Everyone can be engaged. You can either watch. I think we had to do a virtual one in 2020 because of the pandemic and understandably so, but even 
was still beautiful the way they put it together. It is where we launch our general, our our candidate and our nominee into the general election with all of the urgency and fervor and support that we can. It's where we show the world that this is what we believe, this is who we believe in, and this is what we're fighting for. And you know, it it consists of a bunch, a lot of speeches. There are a lot of speakers. <laughs> we're giving four minute speeches. Some people are giving fifteen minute speeches. But it's really to show the 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 whole the the totality of the party so earlier in the week it's like the up and coming you know folks so you should probably look to see folks like maxwell frost speaking right like which also love him oh my god just super inspired like there's yeah there are very few people that get me going these days and like get oh my, my heart gosh. beating ready to do service and he's one of them Absolutely. but you know you see your you know the the younger generation the next up in the party and then you also you'll see you know the president and the vice president you know giving and delivering their speeches about where we are and where we're headed and that whole process is why but it, it happens and it's beautiful and it's dope yeah and to that point of it being you know sort of this amazing collection of people and speeches and moments and platforms when does this happen and what happens sort of running up to it? like how yes is, what's the prep period I mean, it is it it happens within like a year and a half. And the way that Reverend Daughtry explained it to me was that what you're doing is you're essentially building a city within a city. So from starting, so let's see, where are we? This is like a little festival. So starting, yeah. So starting in the fall, so starting this fall, like of 2023, fall, like December, they yeah. once the city first they're gonna announce whether it's in Atlanta, New York, Chicago, whoever it is, right? They're gonna announce where it is. And then staff, people was the, led by the DNC. They will start to move into the area and they will start to kind of construct the stage and start to figure out where the hotels are going to be and what the events are going to be and doing the community work and going out and letting people know and doing the social responsibility that at least that's what Democrats do because we care. But they will, you know, start <laughs> to build build this platform. And then as it comes together, maybe like three or four months out, the speaker lineup will be decided. And then there are a group of speech writers. At the convention runs on super volunteers. I mean, there are, you know, people get paid adequately for their work, but a lot of people just jump in and do it because it is, I mean, you're working in the who's who of politics and you are also getting to go to the convention and it's just a dope mm -hmm. thing to do, especially if you're a political nerd. But there, there is a collection of maybe anywhere from 10 to 15 speech writers that come together and the, the, the DNC and White House leadership will tap, you know, a comms person or a set of comms, senior comms folks to say, hey, this is the story of the convention. This is what we want to say. And then we will go to, they will, that will be relayed to the speech writers who will be led by their speech writing for the convention and uh, some consultant fashion. And then that team of 12 will then be assigned to speakers and then they will work with the speakers on what they, they'll do the conference that i'm talking about what would you like to say do you have thoughts here's some ideas no you can't talk about that no 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 yes yes <laughs> yes oh wow this is going to actually be really good and then the speech writers come back and they report out and then that's how they build what i call that uh, that connective tissue where we try to because we want to tell one coherent story about who we are as a party and figure out like okay who are going to be the breakout moments if you remember famously this amazing man right here that came on the political scene at a democratic convention. There's not mm -hmm. black, America, you know, blue America, red America, United States of America. So that's what happens. And then, you know, there's the going back and forth and the back and forth. And there's yeah. the speech prep conferences and preps in different rooms and whatnot. And then, you know, people are, they do rehearsals because getting people in these big arenas where they've never spoken before, they feel like they're all, you know, ready to meet the moment. But when you get up there and you're sweating, you need to know what to do. So you run through it and then it happens. Oh my gosh, the sweating where it just reminds me of any time I had to take make a speech in college and the clamminess of my hands and my voice got all shaky. And I was like, I don't know if this part was made for me. Well, you <laughs> yeah. have to find something to do with you gotta find something to do with them. You can you can hold the podium. A little you can, like you know, yeah. you can, you know, you can grip talk you my can... hands. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all of this is so interesting. Thank you so much for coming on. No we problem. love giving these like behind the scenes looks into yeah. these really cool roles that you get to do and are so amazing at. So we are very appreciative of having you on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. And, you know, keep doing what y'all doing. I think it's super important to make sure that it's accessible to everyone because everything is political.
Absolutely. Is there anywhere yeah. people can find oh, you? Yeah. Anything we can plug for you? I'm on Twitter at C Michael Huntley. I'm on Instagram, but mostly just around, you know, sharing things in that way. But yeah, follow me on Twitter. And every now and then I'll get inspired and I'll do kind of technical representations of what speeches to be. But you'll find speeches, you'll find political, and you'll find a lot of Beyonce there. Lots and lots of B. Lots of Beyonce. That's what we need. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay.